Good evening. Uh, like the other speakers, I also wanted to start off by just saying thank you. Um, it's been a real honor to have received this chair and also a real honor to be able to share some of my research here with you all um, this evening. So thank you very much. Um, let me start off by um, posing the question, what is personality? Now, I'm guessing for most of us, this seems like a pretty straightforward question. Most of us could readily come up with uh, descriptors um, to characterize pretty much anyone's personality. For someone like Mother Teresa, we'd probably say, oh, her personality includes traits like kind and compassionate. Michelle Obama's personality is probably characterized by traits like, well, it depends on what you think of Michelle Obama, but maybe uh, ambitious, supportive, health conscious. Many traits come to my mind when someone asks me to characterize my son and my daughter. So from this sort of um, perspective, it seems that personality is about people's enduring traits, the characteristics that characterize a person, the traits that characterize a person across time and situations. Now, this trait-based kind of view of personality has dominated the field of psychology for decades. And this makes a lot of sense. It's understandable. It fits intuition to think about personality in terms of traits. It fits the language that we use to think about and communicate about other people's personality. But there's a slight problem with this trait-based view of personality, and that is that it doesn't always fit the data. People's behavior, our behavior, me and you, our behavior oftentimes does not exhibit the kind of consistency across time and situations that a strict trait-based view of personality would suggest. Instead, the people we are, who I am, my personality when I'm giving an interview, is really not the same personality that I am when I'm playing on the beach with my daughter, nor when I'm advising my graduate students. Instead, personality tends to be characterized, or most of our personalities, tend to be characterized by variability across context, by what personality psychologists call if-then patterns or if-then contingencies. If I'm giving a lecture, if I'm giving a talk, then you'll get this in terms of my personality. I'm assertive and extroverted. But if you find me in a faculty meeting, I'm actually quite different, in fact, quite the opposite. I'm very reserved and uh, introverted instead. This is the kind of um, conundrum that personality psychologists had to deal with, that the data don't show the kind of consistency that the enduring trait-based view of personality would suggest. I was a graduate student at NYU in the late 1990s when a groundbreaking theory of personality was introduced by Walter Mischel some 100 blocks up north um, at Columbia. He's actually still there doing this kind of research. His theory, the key insight of his theory, um, first of all, it provided a solution um, to this, this conundrum that personality can be so variable and yet still connote something stable and enduring about a person. The key insight of Walter Michel's theory is that inconsistency in behavior and stableness and enduringness that we associate with personality can be and does coexist. How is that possible? The idea here is that you can think about personality in terms of being inconsistent across situations. So I'm different in one situation than the next, just as all of you are but there's still stability in my personality within situations over time. So I am extroverted in one situation, introverted in another, showing inconsistency, but you can count on me stably, enduringly. You can predict me to be extroverted every time I'm in the lecture hall and introverted every time I'm at a faculty meeting. So you have that stability at this level of these overall if-then contingencies. Let me tie this insight that Walter Michel had about the sort of dual nature of personality to my own research, how it's informed and shaped how I think about my own research. Since my days at NYU, I've been fascinated by how significant others influence how we think about ourselves, how we evaluate ourselves. I've been fascinated by this idea that we developed essentially relational selves or relational personalities with specific individuals in our lives. So take Bob as an example here, made up person represented by the black silhouette figures on this slide here. Bob, over time, has developed a particular relational personality with his wife, 
potentially a very different relational self or personality or me with his children, with his father, with his boss, with his best fishing buddy, Jack. Now, in my research, I'm not just interested in this idea, hey, we act differently with different significant others. This we all know. But what the, I'm really interested in my research, the crux of my research, is I'm looking at the ways in which these relational selves influence not only our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in our interactions with our significant others themselves, but also how they influence our interactions with new people that we encounter in our everyday lives. That the influence of relational selves extends beyond the significant other context. Let me give you an example here. Take Amanda here in the green sweater. Pretend this is Steve, her brother. Okay? When Amanda is around Steve, okay, this, her relational self is very competitive. They grew up competing, you know, I'm better than you, no, I'm better, I got better grades, whatever. She's very competitive. That's her relational self when she's with her brother Steve. That's important to know, because every time she's around Steve, we can predict something about her. She's going to act pretty competitive. But what my research has shown, okay, this is in the laboratory, experiments have shown is that um, Amanda's relational self with Steve influences her behavior more often than she probably realizes in her interactions with other people. When subtle cues remind us of a significant other, what happens is that brings to the forefront the relational self we are with the significant other. Only now we're enacting that relational self with a new person, and the significant other isn't even there. What my research shows, I want to give you a little bit more concrete um, flavor of what that means to sort of treat other people as if they were our significant other. And again, this is happening oftentimes unconsciously. In the laboratory, just to give you an example, we might subliminally expose our research participants to the name of a significant other. So they're not even aware that they're being flashed with the name Bob or Steve or Jake or what have you. And their behavior, their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors shift in interacting with a new person in the laboratory in ways that reflect how they typically interact with their significant other. So for example, people tend to pursue the goals that they typically pursue with their significant other, but now with a new person. They evaluate themselves positively or negatively, as they do with their significant other, but now with a new person. They, um, they judge their behavior against standards that a significant other holds, even though the significant other isn't there. They behaviorally approach or avoid the new person as if he or she were the significant other. So relational selves has this impact that extends far beyond the significant other context. Let me bring it back to personality. What is personality from, my, from the perspective of my research? In my research, then, I'm not interested in ifs or situations such as a lecture hall or um, a faculty meeting. I'm not interested in shifts in personality as a function of those kinds of situations. I care about significant other situations. Okay, I care about when Bob is with his wife, the fact that his personality shifts to be fun and, and opinionated. But when Bob, the context is his boss, Bob shifts to be serious and submissive. But again, it's not just that his personality shifts when he's with these different significant others in his life. It shifts whenever he is in an encounter with a new person who somehow consciously or not, and again, we've shown it happens many, many more times unconsciously than we obviously realize, these shifts in his relational personality occur. And just as with the broader Michelle theory of personality, I would argue these relational facets of our personality are really, really core components of our personality and give us both that dual nature, that inconsistency, capturing inconsistency in who we are and how we relate to other people, while at the same time embodying consistency, that stability that we associate with the term personality. Because every time you're with a particular significant other or someone who reminds you of that significant other, you're such and such a way, even though in a different context, in a different relational context, you're a different way. Again, you show stability within significant other context over time, even while showing inconsistency across context. OK, so what is my answer to what personality is? Yeah, sure, personality is sometimes made up of broad traits. I have a colleague and very dear friend 
who is optimistic no matter where, when, and with whom um, he's interacting. It's, it's maddening at times, um, but because uh, I'm not that way. But what I would argue is that a more nuanced, a more accurate view of personality captures this inconsistency, this instability, this meaningful instability in our personality, while again, still allowing us to predict people, to still capture, embody the stableness, enduringness we come to associate with the term personality. Okay, let me end by just saying that I feel so fortunate and proud, really, to be a part of this institution. The psychology department at, um, here at Cal has been open to research and perspectives like mine, ones that challenge more traditional trait-based views of personality. And to me, this very fact epitomizes um, something about Cal's personality, so to speak. And we've heard this um, theme already in two of the speakers' um, remarks, and that's Cal's longstanding disposition to be open to, but really more than that, to celebrate diversity and not just the people that we see here around on campus, not just in terms of race and socioeconomic status, but in my case, in terms of perspectives, perspectives on the nature of human behavior. That our university, our great university here, at once supports, encourages, sometimes challenges and debates, but ultimately embraces a diversity of perspectives and makes me be able to do the research that I do here at Cal. Thank you.